The Last of the Sparks. My name is Aaron Sparks. Back in February of 2008, I decided I needed a change in my monotonous life. Whether that change would come in the form of a new job or a toothbrush, I didn't know. I was never the most adventurous person. I always found it difficult to veer away from my comfort zone. The limit of my existence is usually dependent upon which books I was reading at the time. It took me a while to realize that most of the happiness in my life was deserved from works of fiction, from the stories I've often found myself lost in for days at a time. I was an avid bookworm, as miserable as an expression as that is. Once I realized my true outlet, I immediately knew what I wanted. I purchased a small shop, quit my boring job, renovated it, and transformed it into a bookstore. I had never been happier. The next two years were the best of my life. The store had been, had been a huge hit with the locals. My perspective on work has had been completely altered. And I was feeling genuinely happy for the first time since my childhood. It was the winter of 2010 that she walked into my store. She stepped up. She stepped outside of the snow and approached me with a large bin bag. Etchings of age covered her pale face and hands. She must have been at least 80 years old. Sliming the bag on the counter, she simply said, These are for you. I looked inside of the bag to find a selection of the greatest novels ever written. Why? I asked, confused. You want money for these, or some kind of book trade? No. They're yours to have, she said. Take them. Feeling a feeling of unease swept over me as I stood in the woman's presence. Her dirty, gray fringe slightly concealed her face as a cold gaze bent my vision. Are are you sure you want me to have them? I asked. Wouldn't you rather sell them? No, I have no use for them. Or for money. Uh, Okay, thank you. Um, what's your name? Lucy. She departed from my store shortly after muttering her final words. I found it all too strange that someone would give away such great books for nothing. But I suppose some people are just nice. I made my way home that night and took the books with me so I can go through them. I piled them up on the table and was surprised to see that all of them were fantastic were in fantastic conditions. A couple of them seemed to be first editions, and others were variations that I've never seen before. It took took me a moment to realize it, but novels that I was looking at were not as I remembered them to be. The first book was uh, the first book I picked up was *The Green Mile*. On the cover, there was an image of John Coffrey smiling, and holding up two dead, naked girls. I opened it up and flipped through the first page. In this version of the novel, he was in fact guilty of the rape and murder of both children. I made my way through to the end of the book and read through the execution scene. All of the officers who originally grown to love John Coffrey in the original novel were now laughing uncontrollably and screaming racial taunts as he was being executed. My eyes seemed to have enough and my stomach had felt enough too. The next book I picked up was The Catcher in the Rye. The artwork upon the front page seemed to be of a dead body splattered in the street. 
as I see uh, as seen from an aerial perspective. I threw, flipped through the book until I until I reached chapter 14. After Holden Caulfield speaks of messing with the idea of suicide, he suddenly breaks down in tears and jumps from the window, cracking his skull on the pavement below. The book abruptly ended after that. Then, I picked up The Lord of the Flies. The defining image of this novel was a large child with the face of a pig. He was covered in blood and surrounded by decaying corpses. After thumbing through the f few pages, I reached the point in which Peggy is described as being non-human, vicious, and a hungry animal. A chapter, a chapter or so later, Jack insulted Peggy, which led him to lose his temper and rip Jack apart. Peggy then proceeded to kill and eat the rest of the children. The remainder of the book was the same line repeated over and over again. Peggy sat alone on the island, waiting for death. I read through the few books that were left on a pile, and they had been changed in some sick way. The Great Gatsby, Withering Heights, To Kill a Mockingbird, Ulysses, every one of them. Just as I reached the bottom of the pile, I noticed the final book was one I've never heard of before. It was called The Last of the Sparks. Considering the contact of the other books thus far, I found the inclusion of my last name and the title unnerving. Still, it was just a book. The front cover was of six gravestones, with words way too small for me to even read. I looked at I looked at the top of the corner of the book and noticed that there was a sell-by date on it, June 4, 2013. I nervously opened it up to see the beginning of the story, Chapter 1, Alice Sparks. My stomach dropped as I read my mother's name upon the page. I felt dizzy and confused as I anxiously made my way through the chapter. It seemed to detail a regular day in life of the character, that is, until I reached the last page. Alice was crossing the road when the heel of her shoe broke, causing her to fall. She didn't get to her feet fast enough. A speeding car struck her, puncturing both of her lungs. I felt sick. I put the book down and went straight to bed, hoping for some sleep. As it turned out, that was wishful thinking. I lay there for the most of the night, as a number of questions ran through my mind, but day daybreak and I by daybreak, I had managed to get a couple of hours of sleep, but only after I spent an hour convincing myself there was nothing to worry about. It's just a book, I told myself. It's just a book. The next morning when I got to work, I was feeling worse for wear. It wasn't, it wasn't around... It wasn't until around lunchtime I began to perk up and regain a bit of energy. And then the phone rang. I answered the call. And I heard my father sobbing on the other hand. I immediately knew what had happened. I closed the shop and ran to the hospital, but it was already too late. She was gone. The victim of a hit and run driver doing 60. 35, he said. I spent a couple of weeks helping to take care of my dad. Me, my brother, and my sister stayed with him. In turns, and we looked after him. We all looked after each other. It wasn't until a few months later 
that I picked up the last of the sparks again. It had scared me so much last time that I had to consider tossing in in the trash, but I never did. Rather, I felt strongly compelled to hang on to it. I opened the book up to page 37, and there it was, chapter 2, Patrick Sparks. The story was more of the same day, a day in the life of a man that bore my father's name. It documented an ordinary day, ordinary, that is, until the part where he shot himself in the kitchen whilst on the phone with his son. Suddenly, I was possessed by an urge to run to the phone and call my father, to speak with him, comfort him. But then I realized what I may be doing. Before I had a chance to hang up, someone picked up on the other end. Then he was gone. I got my black suit and tie out once more and repeated the same process for another parent. It ruined us all. After the funeral, I refused to touch the book. What if I had caused these deaths by reading it? I couldn't go through it all again. But on Christmas Eve of 2011, I got a phone call from my brother's wife, Heather. Will had been putting up Christmas lights on the roof when he slipped on a patch of ice, uh, ice-coated shingles, and broke his neck. He died almost instantly, the coroner said. I lost it. I threw the phone at the wall and began to sob into my sleeve. Anger took the pain away, but for a moment, long enough for me to pick up the book and read th chapter 3. It exactly as Heather had described it. I fell asleep and woke up the next day, the book still on my lap. I decided to read ahead to discover who might be next to go, whether it be me or one, one of my sisters. Whoever was next, I was determined to warn them or give myself advance notice, as the case may be. I turned to chapter 4. Mary and Sarah Sparks. I rushed through the story as fast as I could until I reached the end. Both of my sisters and their partners would, be, would drown in the lake after colliding with another car on a one-way bridge. That same sickly feeling overtook me. I met with my sisters later that day to exchange gifts that I told them as calmly as I could that they ought to be careful while driving. I tried to sound as sincere as possible as I mentioned the lake, the bridge, and the fact that all four of them would be in the car at the same time. <laughs> of course, they, they didn't listen. They didn't take me seriously. Chalking my apprehension up to fears of losing more loved ones. At least I told them. Mary and Sarah drowned eight months later in August 2012. Following the funeral, I picked up the book to the final pages. Chapter 5, Aaron Sparks. But I didn't read it. I decided I'd rather not live in fear for who knows how long. So I decided to save it for a later, later time. After all, there was a sale by date on it for a reason. Everything has been normal for the past five months or so. I've lost interest in reading though. So I'm back to my old miserable self. I 
question myself every day as to why the old woman was doing this to me. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It's gonna be over soon anyways. I just finished reading the final chapter. It's June 4th, 2013. I'm sitting in my basement waiting for her to arrive. That's the way the ending goes. Or so I've read. <laughs>